Francis Ngannou put everything on the line when he fought out his UFC contract and left the promotion, and it paid off in ways that nobody could have possibly predicted. But not every fighter that's decided to take life-altering risks has been so lucky. And with that in mind, I'm Tommy from MMA On Point. A huge thank you to our channel Hall of Famers, and this is 10 times fighters took massive career gambles and failed. Number 10, Vandy versus Heavyweights. We have weight classes for a reason, you hear this all the time. And Vanderlei Silva's insane heavyweight bouts in Pride are a perfect example of why that statement is thrown around all the damn time. At middleweight, Pride's 205, Vandy was a god. He couldn't lose. In fact, he never did until Ricardo Arona beat him at the 2005 GP, and by that time, he'd won 20 fights in that division in a row and was considered one of the best fighters in the world. But from time to time, Vandy decided, hey, I'm good enough to fight guys that have 20 plus pounds on me, and he would fight at open weight or heavyweight to increasingly bad results. The first time he kicked Gilbert Ivel in the junk and he couldn't go on, that one's whatever. Second time he goes to a draw with Crow Cop, okay, that's fine. Then he loses a decision to Mark Hunt, all right, it's getting worse. 2006 Heavyweight Grand Prix, Vandy comes in to give him Kaz Fujita in the first round. He finally wins a heavyweight bout, yay. Not yay, now he has to fight Crow Cop again. Left leg cemetery, Silva is out cold. And you're probably thinking, what's so bad about him taking a few chances? Nothing, but that loss would be the start of his career decline, and he would get KO'd again less than six months later by Dan Henderson, losing his pride title before his disastrous UFC run. Not the biggest risk on the list, that's why it's number 10, but one that certainly made an impact. Number nine, Pettis to the PFL. Testing free agency is something that every fighter who does it gets applauded for these days. You go out there and you find your value. I mean, we just talked about it. Nganu is the best possible example of betting on yourself and it paying off, right? But the reason it's so praised is because it's an incredibly risky venture. And a great example of things probably not turning out how you hoped is when Anthony Pettis went to the PFL. On a two-fight win streak in the UFC, but certainly not at the top of the card anymore, Anthony decided to fight out his contract and rejected the offer the UFC made for his renewal. About 10 seconds after we found out about that, Pettis announced he would be fighting in the 2021 season for the PFL. Really, it was a smart move. He's got huge name value. There's, of course, a chance to win that million in the playoff. It was calculated, but of course, there's always risk, and man, Showtime has just not had a great time in that promotion. He would lose four of his five bouts in the PFL and would not compete in the 2023 season. Number eight, Josh Grisby blows title shot. The promo package for Josh Grisby's fight with Dustin Poirier starts with Mike Goldberg explaining that Grisby insisted on keeping his Octagon debut date, the implication there being that he might not have been for some reason. And as it would turn out, that reason would be a very good one, and this whole thing would blow up in Josh's face. Grisby was meant to be the first ever contender for Jose Aldo's newly minted UFC featherweight title, and he'd earned that chance by winning four straight in the WEC with four first-round finishes. When Aldo had to pull out and delay the fight for about four months, Grisby decided he wanted to stay active and stay on the card to take on the Diamond, a fight that went from the co-main event of a pay-per-view to the Ion TV prelims. Big ouch. Poirier would get 30 27s across the board. Grisby would lose his title shot as well as his next three fights in the promotion before getting cut, then go to jail for five years for a whole host of charges, including domestic abuse and assault. He would never fight again and probably should have just waited a few months for Aldo. Number seven, TJ to flyweight. There are a lot of fighters who will say the hardest thing is making the weight, and once you make the weight, it's easy money. And the guys who say that tend to be the ones who've decided to cut insane amounts of weight. TJ Dillashaw had been angling for a flyweight super fight ever since he secured the bantamweight title a second time when he beat former buddy Cody Garbrandt. But famously, Demetrius Johnson would deny him that, one reason being he didn't think the guy could make the weight. And while it would turn out that TJ could make the weight, as he would when Cejudo granted him the super fight, Johnson's concern would prove to be a warranted one, as Dillashaw had to massively deplete himself to make weight, and this extreme cut likely contributed to him getting KO'd in 32 seconds. Killashaw would pop for EPO afterwards and spend a few years in timeout. Just a big yikes move all around for Mr. Tyler. Number six, Connor fighting short notice Nate. When we talk about unnecessary risks, there's few examples of them being any more unnecessary than when Connor McGregor fought Nate Diaz the first time, because this was 2016 Connor. This was God King Connor. He had the UFC by the balls. There should be Dana's podium, there should be my podium, and then there should be this little thing that's going on. If he had said, oh, I don't know, I want to go box Floyd Mayweather instead of fighting in the octagon for a few years, they would have let him. So the dude didn't need to take any risks or literally do anything that he didn't want to. But as they say, Pride Fighting Championship comes before the fall, and after McGregor's double champ bid against RDA fell through just a few weeks before the event, the biggest star in the whole sport said, yeah, I'll go ahead and fight a new opponent. Oh, he wants to do it at 170 when my last fight was at 145? Sure, I don't give a fuck, it'll be fun. 
And to be fair to him, it was fun. It was very fun for the fans. Wasn't the best night for Connor himself though. Now you could argue that this gamble did in fact end up paying off in the long term, but the dude almost couldn't miss at that point and he nearly did. And he is still taunted by fans and Nate about it to this day. So while it ended up being a net positive, you can't say it was an ideal outcome for the notorious one. Number five, the tragic tale of Hatsu Hioki. Coming into the UFC from the Japanese regional scene as both the Shudo and Sengoku featherweight champion with a 24 and four record, Hatsu Hioki would get back to back victories on pay-per-view cards before getting offered a fight with the best featherweight in the entire world, Jose Aldo. And I mean, 30 fights into your career, this is like the culmination of everything. But Hatsu wasn't having it. He told Dana White he'd rather get one more under his belt in the promotion first, and then he would challenge Jose Aldo for the title. The UFC was like, uh, okay man, well then here's Ricardo Lamas, go nuts. Guess what happened, can you guess? Hioki would lose, and lose, and lose. After dropping five of his next six in the promotion, Hatsu was let go following a head kick KO loss to Dan Hooker. I can totally understand feeling like you're not ready to fight Jose Aldo, but was one more UFC fight really going to make a big difference? At least you could have said you fought for the title. Tough, tough break for the Iron Broom. Oh yeah, that was his awesome nickname, by the way. Number four, Volk versus Islam 2. This one hurts my soul because I really do love Volkanovski. That bald little Aussie man is just a delight, and everyone was jacked when he volunteered to step in on less than two weeks notice to save 294 after Charlie Olives dropped out. The pair threw down earlier this year for the lightweight strap and the title of pound for pound number one, something that Alex maintained over Islam despite Mahachev having narrowly won the bout. Volk seemed loose during fight week and in the kind of place where maybe he could pull this off without any prep, but a first round head kick finish would prove that to be entirely incorrect. Now, there've been plenty of short notice fights, and so why aren't all of those just flooding this list? Well, I think what makes this wholly unique is that he pretty much already had another fight lined up and he didn't in any way need to do this, but went out of his way to fight Islam with no preparation, a rematch that you would think is legacy defining. It was a big, big gamble. The guy's got balls bigger than cantaloupes, but certainly not the outcome he was hoping for on this one. Number three, Tony saves 249. Cue up the Vince McMahon crying, cutting off the interview meme because grandpa, did Tony Ferguson and Habib Nurmagomedov ever fight? You know what makes this entry extra awful? When I found out the reason that Tony decided to fight at UFC 249 instead of waiting for Habib, something he absolutely could have done. Take a listen. At least some of the people in the world have a little bit of hope, you know what I mean? Because the guys that are really doing it are the doctors and the nurses, and people taking care of everybody. Yeah, he was doing it because he wanted to put on a show for the doctors dealing with the pandemic. God damn it, Justin Gaethje. Why do you gotta be so good? And while it was a barn burner, it would ultimately be the end of his epic streak, the end of his run at the title, and the start of a six fight losing streak. I hate it. I hate it so much. But ugh, for all of this to have been one fight away, one last chance for a showdown, and for it to end that way on a card the guy agreed to to give the doctors of the world some hope during an awful time. I'm about to be that Vince McMahon meme for real. We gotta move on to the next entry. Number two, Ben Askren's comeback. It's pretty insane to think about the perception of Ben Askren's career prior to him signing with the UFC. No interest. No interest. And we'll see him in World Series fighting or something Exactly. Else. I'm sure they'll pick him up. I don't, I don't even care. Next question. He'd firmly carved out his place in MMA history as that great question mark of his era. I was wondering if I'm ever gonna make the UFC. Undefeated, a champion in one and Bellator. Was he better than GSP? Would he have been the welterweight champion in the UFC? Who knows? You could argue it. How could you gauge it? He was the splinter in the collective MMA mind after he called it a career in 2017 at 18 and 0. But then suddenly, a trade. The only trade in MMA history. It wasn't really one, but whatever. Ben agreed to return to fighting and have his contract bought up by the UFC. Now, I can't really blame the guy for wanting to get in the mix and prove himself. And man, do you guys remember? the hype, everything this guy tweeted or said in an interview turned to gold. He was instantly a star. You remember when those guys thought Ashkin was gonna come here and then I got his ass kicked three times? <laughs> <laughs> and while he got off to a rocky start against Robbie Lawler, he still ended up the winner, albeit controversially. But then of course he got Jorge. Gamebred etched this man's legacy in stone in just five seconds. It is without question the lasting image of Ben Askren in the sport, even though I think that's entirely unfair. And his career was impressive as hell and he did great things. But unfortunately that finish will just always be there. Huge risk, huge consequence, 
consequences. The loss after Tamaya was a footnote, and since Jake Paul just beat Nate Diaz in a boxing match, I think we can give him a pass on that one. Number one, Holly Holm not waiting for Ronda. When Nganu walked out with that fumbled the bag bag, and everyone was like, oh man, that's so cool and ironic because he did the opposite of that. He should give that bag to Holly because she kinda did fumble it sadly when she chose not to wait for that rematch with Ronda Rousey after famously taking the bantamweight strap from her. This one's pretty baffling on a lot of fronts. I can't fault Holm 100% here because she's an athlete. She just beat the best fighter in the damn world. I'm sure her confidence in her abilities were sky high. Of course, she wanted to stay active and be a champion and beat people up. Yes, there's always risk in that, obviously, but how could she not be feeling herself at that point? What's more baffling is that the UFC was like, yeah, sure, we'll let you potentially destroy one of the biggest rematches we could ever put together. And sure enough, that's exactly what would happen. While on her way to victory on the cards against her first title challenger, Misha Tate, poor Holly met the most terrible of fates, a last minute submission loss. And that was that. While Holmes had many title opportunities since, none of them were that Ronda rematch, and none of them ever will be. You know who can't stop taking risks but never fails? The editor of this video, Luke Taylor. Please go and show him all the love on his social media. Big ol' thanks to our channel champions. You guys are awesome, we couldn't do it without you. If you want to be one of them, there's a join button. You get all kinds of cool content. Or you can like and subscribe, that would be awesome too. Who else took a big chance that didn't pay off? Sound off in the comments, and thank you so much for watching. Peace!